Welcome to TPM Vids Disney Beat, where we talk about all things Disney. If you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button and click the bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video. We also have Instagram and Twitter. You can find us at TPM Videos. There is a lot we love about Disney, but then there are some things that raise some questions. Well, I asked you on the YouTube community tab and on Instagram, what were the worst changes Disney has made in the theme parks? You all mentioned some really great topics from the past and even some from the present. So today we're going to be exploring the successes and downfalls of some of Disney's decisions as we count down the top five worst mistakes at the Disney theme parks. Number five. Ever since Star Wars Rise of the Resistance opened at Hollywood Studios in December of 2019, this was the start of Disney using virtual queues for new attractions. Many of you believe virtual queues are one of the worst changes Disney could have made. We've seen virtual queues used on Rise of the Resistance as well as Web Slinger's A Spider-Man Adventure. They also just announced that when Remy's Ratatouille Adventure opens at Epcot, that will also use a virtual queue. With Disney's new rides and attractions in the past, you'd have to stand in a line and wait for hours to experience the new ride. If you showed up early, you were almost guaranteed to ride. But since virtual queues run on a lottery system, there is a chance you may not get a boarding group, no matter how hard you try. This is one of the biggest downfalls of the system, especially if you're heading to the park just to explore the new land and ride. When you're going to the park, you sort of want to be guaranteed that you can experience these new rides. Rise of the Resistance at Disneyland has really improved their operations, and recently they got through 300 boarding groups. This means more guests are having luck getting into the virtual queue. But at Hollywood Studios, it's a little different and they barely get through 180 boarding groups. The ride still goes down quite frequently over there. This means that less guests who visit the park are getting a chance to experience one of the best rides out there. On the flip side though, when you're successful at entering the virtual queue, they can be great. You get to spend less time in line, get to explore more of the park, and enjoy some of the entertainment. When Rise of the Resistance first opened at Hollywood Studios, this is exactly what I did. But I can see this being a bit different considering the park landscape during the pandemic. Many of the crowd eating shows are not open, and there's just that much less you can do while you wait. If Disney does begin to introduce more virtual queues eliminating standby, this means there will be even more people clogging up the walkways. We may not like waiting in long lines, but frankly, these queue spaces actually help spread out crowds. For virtual queues to really work, they'll need to open more entertainment and build new attractions that can eat up crowds. I know there's going to be a high demand for Remy's Ratatouille Adventure, but I don't think it should be a virtual queue. Runaway Railway didn't use a virtual queue, and that opening went great. I'd put Remy and Railway in the same category of attraction. There are family rides that help round out the attraction lineup in addition to the major e-tickets at the park. I think in the future we'll see more virtual queues on select attractions, but for it to actually work, they need to be rides that are extremely reliable and offer a high capacity. Maybe Remy's Ratatouille Adventure will be exactly this. It's rumored that the hourly capacity is about 2,200 riders, which is much higher than most Disney rides. It'll be interesting to see how this all works out. So, what are your views on virtual queues? Number 4 Back in September of 2001, the giant sorcerer hat made its debut at what was then Disney MGM Studios. Many of you said the sorcerer hat was a mistake, but it was for the fact that Disney removed it in 2015, leaving Hollywood Studios without a park icon. So, the Sorcerer Hat made its debut for the 100 Years of Magic celebration, and it was actually supposed to be a temporary structure. At the time, many fans had mixed feelings about the 122-foot blue Sorcerer Hat. The main argument was that it was covering the beautiful Chinese theater, and it ruined the overall feel of the area. Hollywood Boulevard was supposed to transport you into the golden age of Hollywood, but the Sorcerer Hat really didn't scream vintage Hollywood. 
Now, before September of 2001, the park's icon was the Earful Tower, which was part of the now-defunct Blacklot Tour. The tower was used in all kinds of marketing, but as the 100 Years of Magic celebration unfolded, the Sorcerer's Hat began to take its place and was used more and more in marketing. I mean, in its own right, it was pretty iconic, and it did feel like the park finally had a centerpiece in the same way as the other parks. It was just a shame it had to cover this wonderful piece of architecture. I mean, the park was designed to have the Chinese theater be the weenie, the building that draws you right into the park. Well, once the 100 Years of Magic celebration ended on December 31st, 2002, Walt Disney World was still feeling the effects from 9-11, which greatly impacted travel. Very little money was being spent at the resort during this time, so taking the hat down was not on Disney's priority list. Now, just as travel was beginning to fully recover, we'd find ourselves in the Great Recession from 2007 until 2009. Now, there was really no need for Disney to spend the money to remove the hat. But the longer it stayed, the more it was used as the park icon. People got attached to this hat. I mean, I kind of did. Well, in October of 2014, Disney confirmed the Sorcerer Hat would finally be removed. Demolition began in January of 2015, and it was completed by February. Hollywood Studios officially lost the park icon that was used for 14 years. At this point, the park had spent more time with the hat than without it. During its time from 2001 until 2015, a brand new generation of Disney fans emerged who only remembered the park with the Sorcerer's Hat. So this was all a pretty drastic change. Since the Backlot Tour closed in September of 2014, this would mean the Earful Tower's days were numbered. So Disney began using the Hollywood Tower Hotel as the new park icon. I do personally like this structure as the icon, especially since it's one of the first things you see from the parking lot. But what are your thoughts on losing the giant sorcerer's hat? Number 3. Staying at Hollywood Studios, another one of the worst mistakes you all said was Disney closing the Great Movie Ride. I used to love the Great Movie Ride and I have so many fond memories of riding it as a kid. The attraction opened in May of 1989 and was one of the two original rides that opened with the park. With a ride time of approximately 22 minutes, the Great Movie Ride took riders through iconic scenes from 12 classic films in motion picture history. At the D23 Expo in 2017, it was announced that the Great Movie Ride would close on August 13th, 2017. This was to make way for what we now know as Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. Now, I love the ride. I think Runaway Railway is a fantastic Disney dark ride that highlights a lot of the new technology, and it's really fun to top it all off. At the time, though, in 2017, before the Great Movie Ride closed, the park only had four other rides, that being Toy Story Mania, Tower of Terror, Rock and Roller Coaster, and Star Tours. So closing one of the five rides in a park that lacks rides isn't the smartest idea. Sure, there were shows, but there needs to be a good selection of rides. Disney could have easily kept the Great Movie Ride open, and they could have built Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway in Star Wars Launch Bay. Mickey Mouse would have been a perfect fit for Animation Courtyard, and keeping the Great Movie Ride open could have also helped absorb some of the crowds during construction. I do have to mention, though, that the Great Movie Ride was starting to show its age. It was at a point where a substantial chunk of money was needed to refurbish it. So no matter what, the ride would have needed some work, but at least there would have been an additional ride in the park instead of a replacement. With the purchase of Fox, this would have been a great opportunity to update the ride and include other IPs Disney now own themselves. I really do love Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, but I still think the location is a bit out of place. Placing the ride in Animation Courtyard would have made the area thematically complete with Voyage of the Little Mermaid and Disney Junior. I mean, I think Disney could have done so much with the Great Movie Ride considering how many IPs they now own. Which actually brings us into number two. A lot of you said forcing more intellectual properties, or IPs for short, into the parks is one of the worst things Disney has done. Now, let me start off by saying the idea of IPs have been around since the early days of Disneyland. Walt loved creating synergy between his film and TV endeavors with the theme park attractions. 
The Submarine Voyage, The Swiss Family Treehouse, Casey Jr. Circus Train, Peter Pan's Flight, Davy Crockett Canoes, plus so much more were all based on existing IPs. Even in the 90s during the Disney Renaissance era, we saw many of these IPs quickly introduced into the theme parks. Aladdin's Royal Caravan, Legend of the Lion King, Beauty and the Beast Live on Stage, and Tarzan Rocks all opened within the first couple months of their film's release. I mean, a lot of people come to the Disney theme parks expecting Disney characters. So what's changed now? And why does it feel like IPs are being forced? Well, I think it has a lot to do with the lack of original attractions versus ones based on IPs. At Walt Disney World, the last major attraction that wasn't based on past IP was Expedition Everest in 2006. At Disneyland, it's probably Soren, which opened in 2001. So quite some time has passed since more original stories like Big Thunder Mountain, Pirates of the Caribbean, and Spaceship Earth were introduced. Major additions from the past decade include Galaxy's Edge, Toy Story Land, Cars Land, and Pandora, which are all based on IPs. Now these are some of the most immersive lands when it comes to theme parks, and each of them have some really fantastic state-of-the-art attractions. So the real problem I think some people have with IP is when they are placed into areas that aren't necessarily a fantasy world. A prime example is World Showcase at Epcot. IP integration really started with the introduction of the Three Caballeros and the Mexico Boat Ride in 2007, then with Maelstrom transforming into Frozen Ever After in 2016. There are a lot of people who dislike Frozen Ever After just because it replaced Maelstrom, but I gotta say, I really do like the ride. You could argue that Maelstrom was a classic in its own right, but Frozen Ever After is classic traditional Disney a water-based dark ride with some impressive animatronics and catchy music. I mean, sign me up. Anytime I've been to the park, the Frozen Ever After line has always been longer than any Maelstrom line I've seen. So IP is popular. At Walt Disney World, Epcot is the park with the least IPs, but now, almost all the new additions that have been announced involve IP, like Guardians of the Galaxy, Remy's Ratatouille Adventure, and even Harmonious. I personally don't think this is bad, especially since it has and will bring more people into Epcot who probably would have never experienced the park in the first place. Epcot is definitely evolving and changing with the times, but there is still a lot of original IP at the park. I mean, as long as these new projects are executed with high standards and deliver an entertaining experience, I'm really excited for all of it. I can't wait till the Epcot transformation is fully complete. Number 1 To this day, people still talk about Push the Talking Trash Can, and I was really surprised at how him getting removed from the park was mentioned so many times. So Push was a radio-controlled trash can that made daily appearances in Tomorrowland. He moved freely and interacted with guests. He was actually quite the character. If I ever made of steel, hold a little camera. Zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, and now I'll mess with your autofocus. Not only was he interactive, but Push was also an actual trash can. He became a staple of Tomorrowland at Magic Kingdom, and guests adored him. This was the kind of thing that brought the Disney magic to life. I loved running into Push. In February of 2014, Disney announced they would be saying goodbye to Push for good, and fans took to social media using the hashtag SavePush and BringBackPush. According to a New York Daily News article, there was some ambiguity to the verbiage as to what Disney owned and what the creator of Push owned. So both parties decided to end the contract. One of the worst things Disney can do is cut back on live entertainment, which is why losing something like Push, Muppet Mobile Lab, Red Card Newspaper Boys, or Captain Jack Sparrow's Pirate Tutorial are such big blows. I mean, it's ironic that an entertainment company seems to be okay with cutting entertainment. Even before the pandemic, entertainment cuts were very common, but it's gotten even worse after the parks reopened. A lot of entertainment is still missing, and who knows if they'll actually bring it back. I love rides and attractions, but for me, live entertainment is such a big part of visiting the Disney theme parks. It completes the entire theme park experience. So one of the worst things Disney can do is take away live entertainment without a replacement. So in your opinion, what are some of the worst mistakes and changes Disney has made? 
I'd love to know. Leave a comment down below to start a conversation, and don't forget to hit that like button if you enjoyed the video.